The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Dave and on today's episode we will be building a skeleton style handheld. Last year I've built this little handheld and people generally liked it. Sadly I never wrote any games for this. I only had a proof of concept working where when you push the buttons there was a line showing on the display. For my first video for Element 14 Presents I wanted to show people how I made it, improve the design and finally play some games on it. We only need some leftover LED legs to do this. Well, this and some more parts like the Antitiny 85 and an I2C OLED display. Sounds good? Well, then let's get started. Amazing hacks. Inspired designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. First, let's take a look at the chip. The Antitiny 85 has 8 pins and it uses 2 of them for power supply. A third pin is used for reset functions. 2 pins are used to connect the display via I2C. In my first design I used Charlie Plexing to read the buttons, but that used up all 3 pins. So I had no chance for adding any outputs like a buzzer. This means there's no sound and I want sound on my little handheld. While searching for ways to improve my design, I found Daniel Champagne's project. He shows games and schematics for an ATtiny 85 based handheld, with the same I2C OLED display that I use. And it even has a buzzer. The reset pin of the ATtiny here is used as an extra input. Doing this means you cannot easily program the ATtiny anymore. There's a fuse you can set for the ATtiny's and when you set that fuse, the reset pin isn't a reset pin anymore and you need that in the ISP communication to program an ATtiny. So Daniel uses two buttons on one ADC and another two buttons on another ADC. I think I can put that together though and only use one pin. Since I don't need another free pin and to keep the code changes minimal that I have to do, I left the action button on that pin. Let's compare the two digital to analog converters that you can make with resistors. To read more buttons I could use an R2R resistor letter, but that would also mean that I have to use 8 resistors and put them on this tiny thing here. And we want to keep the parts count low. The R2R letter gets its name from the relationship of the values you choose for the resistors. It's put together with resistors of one value R and one twice of that value 2R, so R2R. With the help of a binary weighted digital analog converter, I can have four buttons on one ADC pin using only five resistors. The binary weighted DAC is put together with resistors um, that are in a binary relationship. It basically means you have resistors that are of value 2R, 4R, 16R, uh, I forgot the 8R, you get the gist. Because the binary weighted DAC was new to me, I wanted to know what to expect. So I made a spreadsheet that gives me the estimated values of the 10 bit analog to digital converter of the AVR. When button 1 is pressed, resistor 1 and 6 behave as a voltage divider on the ADC pin. The formula to calculate the value of the ADC is down here. The maximum value of the 10 bit ADC is divided here by the sum of R1 and R6 multiplied by R6. When we push two buttons, two parallel resistors technically become a new resistor with a new value. The formula to calculate the resistance of two parallel resistors is over here. Once calculated, we can put it in the formula from before. The smallest difference between all the calculated values was 27 units. That is enough so we can make sure that our code is prepared for any manufacturing variances of the resistor values. With all that theory in our way, we can finally start to solder something. Yay! With the help of EagleCAD, I created a schematic to follow along. The printout is used as a guide while soldering all the parts together. I begin with bending the pins of the button straight. Um, I use pliers for that. Afterwards, I bend the pins of the IC socket so it's easier to solder. 
The first parts that I solder together are the buttons. To prevent my fingers to bleed too early from playing this, I will remove every solder nose that can poke my fingers. And then it's on with resistors for the buttons. Now that every resistor is connected to the D-pad, I can continue with the action button. And there is a first jumper that I have to make, or air wire, whatever you want to call them. I then add some solder to the IC socket to make it easier to solder. And connect the D-pad via the pull-up resistor for the reset pin. Some slight adjustments are necessary to connect the ADC pin to read the binary weighted DAC. You will have to do that all the time if you solder something like that. Here I solder another 3D jumper. A bit later the I2C display and the AT tiny pins are ready to be joined. And from here it is only the buzzer and the battery holder and I will solder that off camera. I have wired everything up now, except for the case. The case. <laughs> um, I want to use this thick copper wire. I have to strip the isolation of this and as you can see <laughs> this wire needs straightening and I could try to counterbend this but then I end up with something that basically looks like this one before. Like, it's not perfectly straight and I'll try to fix that now. For science and stuff. <laughs> I'm trying to catch the end. Uh, set the drill to low speed, so hopefully we don't hit ourselves if, if it breaks loose. So. Nice. It feels a bit curly, and you can see there were like little scratch marks in it, and they twisted around them the copper. I'm now about to bend this wire. Eesh. I'll start at the bottom corner. This wasn't nerve-breaking at all. No. I checked if the angle is straight enough and then continued with the second bend and that one was way more important because that had to be aligned with the first one. And I fixed that here. Once I decided on how and where to put the switch I started bending the copper and then clamp in the switch. I think in the automotive industry this moment is called the wedding, where the motor and the chassis are joined. Well, something like that. So as you can see, this is a bit flimsy. The way I fixed that the last time was, I used thread to join the um, wires together that aren't supposed to be connected with wires. When I was done with the threads, I put on a dab of super liquid glue, which became really, really sturdy. The next step is putting the firmware on. And as you already know, I had to change up some things so the firmware doesn't work. With some changes to the code that I wrote for this board, I can now show the value of each button and each combination on the display. This is what my test program gave me. Every value on the ADC when I push the buttons and the combinations. So the first step was to just insert the calculated resistor values and now I'm gonna compare them with the values that I've calculated. Basically every value is roundabout right. This means I can just use these values and anyone could use this. Let's change the code and play some games. To program the AT Tiny, I use my trusty USB ASP SPI <laughs> programmer. I've made this little adapter board so I can easily plug in AT Tinies um, to program them. You don't have to use a dedicated programmer for that though, because you can use any Arduino and use the Arduino ISP script to make your Arduino a programmer for AT Tinies. To make the three games work with my handheld, I have to basically change two lines in the code. I have to change the analog pin that is read from the AT Tiny, and I also have to change the values so I know what buttons are pressed. Uploading this takes forever. 
The code for Tiny Space Invaders, for example, uses up 96% of the storage that the AT Tiny has. It's 8K of RAM. Now it's done. Okay. Okay. <laughs> ah. Oh. No. Mm. Having that little dithering on there looks really nice. Ah. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. Yay! This is so cool. Yay! Oh, okay. No! Ah! <laughs> oh. I can finally play some games on this little handheld and I'm so happy about that. Since this is a revision, there's not much left that I would have made differently. Maybe the form factor is a bit too square, but other than that I'm really happy with the outcome. If you want to make your own version of this little thing, um, links are in the description below and they will guide you to the Element 14 community where I will share my design files and the updated code and also links to Daniel's work and everything else that I can find. All right, that's all we have for today. Have you ever sorted something like this without the use of any PCBs? What games would you play on a device like this? Let us know in the Element14 community at element14.com presents. We'll see you next time. Auf Wiedersehen.